Good morning. I want to say uh, good morning to those who are worshiping over at Hope East. You are closer to the pancakes than we are, and so we, uh, <laughs> we, we know that. So we're going to close with zero closing songs, and uh, we'll already be there by the time you head down. So, And hi to those that might be listening online on HopeCC.com. We actually have people that do that, all uh, three of you. Hello to you, who, and hey, Mom. Um, <laughs> She's one of the ones that's going to be there. I am excited to share uh, a little bit about my son, Isaac. I have two sons, Drew and Isaac, and Isaac turns 10 years old today. So we're celebrating his birthday today. We are going to be heading over to uh, Jill's parents' house and having a a dinner with them. Uh, It's exciting to think back on his life. There he is. He's the top one there standing. Um... It, it's fun. It's fun as a parent to be able to reflect back on, on all that God has done, and yet it's happened in what feels like a blink. It, it just seems like life is speeding up. It's getting faster and faster. We were actually at his birthday party, and I had the chance to talk to uh, Jeremy Archer a little bit of just like, man, it seems like, seems like yeah, I mean, life, life was going, and then all of a sudden high school, and then college, it, like college was a, a blip, and then the 20s, that's a blip. And it's like, I, I, was, I was asked how old I was, and I, I said to someone last week, well, I'm, I'm 34. And we kept talking and realized we graduated the same year. And he was 37. And I, <laughs> I somehow remained 34, and then I started doing the math. Wait, wait, I'm not 34 anymore. It's like, where'd the last two, two and a half years go? And so I'm, I'm about to become 37, which is crazy. So uh, life is going by so quickly, but uh, we have so enjoyed um, his, his last 10 years. And there are certain things that, that you'll remember that will stand out as, as a parent as you, as you have kids and go along. And, and I would love to share all the joys of uh, parenting this young man. But it's interesting. It's in the last couple of years that he's become um, an ordinary person. If I can use that, and yet still uphold him as like just special and just a delight to his parents, but there are certain things that will put your kid from like extraordinary into like that ordinary category, and, and the thing that's happened in the last few years that has done this for me is he has been evaluated to become a part of a baseball team. Okay, Baseball evaluations cause your kid to go from extraordinary to ordinary. And as a coach, I know this, not just because like, hey, this is something they put, you know, out there for everybody to see. It's like, no, I'm a coach. I'm going to coach him. I'm going to coach his buddies. And so I get the opportunity to, to see the evaluations. And these aren't just like, oh, these are other coaches that I know. And so they'll go easy on him. It's like, no, it's this, it's this outside group of impartial evaluators that know youth baseball. They know what it takes to pitch and to hit and to field and to throw. They, they know all of that. And then they, get, they assign numbers to your kids to say, no, they're not that good. And yeah, maybe they're better than that kid, but he hasn't ever played baseball. And I know your kid's been playing baseball all his life, but no, this is where he is, firmly placed in ordinary baseball player land. And, and really, talking to one of the, one of the other coaches, uh, this this kind of helped me as a dad. Um, he said, "Really, within all the evaluator, all, all the evaluators, all the evaluations, you're going to have like just five, like just landmark guys, and then every, and then it's everybody else." I'm like, "Oh, okay," but you're saying my kid's not one of the five, right? Uh, right? We all, we all want to think like extraordinary. They're awesome, um, and, and and yet uh, he comes from a long line of ordinary people. I'm I'm one of them. I know what it's like to be ordinary in, in big sports situations. I've missed two important free throws to send your team to the state tournament. That's, that's ordinary basketball. Like, it's extraordinary to be the guy who makes them, gets your team to the state tournament, and, and you go win state, right? I, I'm ordinary. You look at my lineage going back, and it's, it's ordinary. My dad did zero sports. My dad played accordion and worked because they were poor and they needed money. And so that's what he did. He 
worked, dressed terribly, and played accordion. That's, that's the lineage, right? The only thing that I have looked and, and found is that his mom is pretty extraordinary. Yes, that's what, what, that should get a response of like, yes, my wife is extraordinary. Um, so he's, he's ordinary, right? And if you feel like this morning you're in that place where just like, I, I feel calm and I feel almost overlooked at work, like just blend in, don't have anything special, like that's, that's actually where God wants you. Like if you're in this place going, I'm such a big deal. I'm so cool. Like, people don't know how special I am. Like, I'm really, really special. Like, that's, it's actually going to be harder for you to receive today's teaching. And so if you're in that place of going, man, I lost my job. I've had this girl say that I'm not enough and, and she's walked away from the relationship. If you are in, just mired in this kind of like family history of like brokenness, if you can look in the last 24, 48 hours and actually see choices that you regret right now, just like, I lied, I cheated, I stole, I lost it. If that's your history, right, you're in a good spot. You're in a good spot because that type of person is the type that Jesus calls to himself. Not only calls to himself, but actually causes them to live with him for like three years. That's what we're going to look at today. In the Gospel of Luke, we're looking at a king and his kingdom. We're in chapters 3 through 9. And I want to go back and just, if you're new with us, I want to catch you up to speed. Okay, real briefly, just catch you up to speed on on where we've been and where we're going here. We've looked often at Luke chapter 4 being Jesus' mission statement. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so even there you can hear him coming for what? For whom? The poor and the prisoners and the oppressed. You can already see it. It's not a people that has to have it all together that God comes for and moves toward. But rather it's those who are in bondage, those who are struggling and he wants to proclaim it's time for the Lord's favor to come. And we also look just at the, the laundry list of people that are actually receptive to Jesus. They're not a who's who in Jewish religious circles. They're nobodies. They're anybodies. They're common, ordinary people. People a lot like you and me. Okay? And the ones that are rejecting Jesus, those are actually the people that you would think would respond. But no, they're not. Synagogue attenders and Religious leaders and friends of his, they're not responding to the message. And so we just come out of about three weeks where Jesus has really been going after some of these spiritual leaders. And he's actually been inciting controversy. He's been willing to provoke other religious leaders to make sure that his agenda, his plan, his mission it is, is communicated. And through that we see him forgiving sin, which only God can do. And we see him healing on the Sabbath, which is a big no-no. So he's provoking them. And now we see him turning from the crowds, turning away from the crowds and the religious leaders to spend time identifying and and hanging out with a few. Okay? So today we're going to look at uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 16. You can open up to that if you want. It's a short passage. We're going to spend a little bit of time there, and then we're actually going to springboard to some other passages So this is going to be somewhat of a launching pad, not going to spend all of our time here, but let me just read for you Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 16. Jesus is going to call his first disciples. One of those days, so we've we've changed, we've transitioned here, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Elphias, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, whom became a traitor. That's it. That's our passage. When Steve was breaking up all the passages, he said, that makes a unit of thought right there. We're going to go with those verses And then I come across this and I go, okay, 
what am I, what am I going to talk about? What, what, what's there? Let, let me start by just addressing some of the uh, minor things within these verses, but then I want to use it to actually springboard to a much bigger topic, an important topic for you and me, which is just, so what's that whole thing, discipleship? What He picks these, kind of, he has these followers who are disciples, and he picks 12 apostles, and so, like, so what? Who cares? What, is that, what does that have to do with us? And that's, that's really important for every message, just the kind of, so what, who cares, but it's going to be like the last three quarters of the message. It's just this, what does it mean? He picked 12, so what, who cares? Why, why does that matter to us, okay? So we're going to spend just a little bit of time here before going, going elsewhere. So let's start here in verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside in order to pray and spent the night praying to God. Now, if you look at the other, we have other gospel accounts, other uh, accounts of Jesus' life, and if you go to those and you look at this calling of the 12, this is the only one where it says he went to a mountainside in order to do what? Pray. To spend the entire night praying to God. So he has this talk with his father. This is unique to Luke's gospel. This is unique to this account. And so you, you have to, as a reader, go, oh, Huh. It's interesting that Luke draws attention to this. And so in certain areas, we are, we are noted for Jesus. We, we have noted for us that Jesus is divine. But this has to be one of those passages where we recognize his humanity. That he is dependent, reliant, needs to seek the Father. This is hugely important. Why? Because these 12 are going to carry forth the message and the mission in the years to come. And so he spends time sitting before his father, dwelling there. And you can just almost in your kind of this holy, imag- sanctified imagination, just like, what did that conversation look like? And, and Jesus just kind of talking through potential names with the father. And, and what about this one? And this one? And this one? And you know what was on that list? Common, ordinary people. The whole list was named of common, ordinary people. People like you and me made that list, right? Well, why did he choose this ordinary person over that one? I I don't know. I can't answer that question. Scripture doesn't answer that question, okay? But isn't it interesting that Jesus just took time to prayerfully seek out the Father's heart? What What do you want? What do I need in my tribe here? What do I need as those who I'm going to pour into and then they're going to pour out to the rest of the world? And he's just sitting at his father's side, receiving from him. And just how long did they spend on the name of Judas Iscariot, the one that would later betray Jesus, right? Interesting. Then we have verse 13. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. So you have to realize there are followers of Jesus, really all of which could be comprised of disciples. So when you say the 12 disciples, right, many people will just say, all right, let's exchange that for apostles because then that communicates some sort of title, that they had kind of a positional leadership there. And so whether you're calling them the 12 disciples, 12 apostles, not a huge deal. There are actually people not in the 12 that will be accounted as apostles, right? If you look at at Paul, he's later called, is not a part of this original group of 12, is later encountered on the road to Damascus. He and Jesus have an exchange, uh, a conversation, and he becomes an apostle. So much so that really he introduces most every letter that he writes as Paul, what? An apostle of Christ Jesus. Or Paul, called to be an apostle. And so it's not just that these 12 are the only apostles, but it tends to be a small number. Really those who, who come face to face and are appointed by Jesus Christ and yet not only so because Barnabas is also called an apostle and we don't have, a, we don't have an account where face to face they talk to one another. All right, So there's, there's this designation, they're apostles and yet that's a, a smaller group within a large group of disciples and you and I, we're in that group. If we, if we name the name of Christ and we follow him, we're a part of his disciples, his followers. And yet these are a special group. They are authorized representatives of him. They are the new wineskins, right? We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Um, Jesus is the new wine pouring his teaching into not old wineskins. That's the religious leaders rejecting his message. No, new wineskins needs these people to be new wineskins that will receive this and then carry this mission further. 
It's interesting to note also, and let me, let me jump over to Acts chapter 1 here, because we're going to see that this group of uh, uh, 12 is actually bigger. Now, there's, they're going to get a specific amount of time with Jesus, but this group is much bigger, so much so that when they need to fulfill the role of Judas Iscariot and, and bring it back to 12 after Judas betrays, um, and, and then they have the 11 kind of after Jesus is raised and taken from them, they want to appoint another person, and there's actually people to choose from. Okay? There's actually people who have been with them this entire time. Acts 1 says, Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time that the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Okay? So even though there were the 12, there was actually a bigger group that was with them from John's baptism all the way through to the resurrection so that then when they're going looking, they're like, all right, let's nominate. They end up nominating two and then selecting one. And so just realize that this group of 12, there's, there's always a bigger group kind of following around Jesus at the time. And that brings us to 14 through 16 here. It says, Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, who's Levi, if you remember that, the tax collector from a couple weeks ago, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. The last two Judases probably to ever be named, right? You just don't hear Judas being used as much anymore these days, right? Okay, interesting uh, uh, point of note here is as we see this list, this list is uh, duplicated in other areas, but not all in the same order, okay? So if you just put up a picture here of the different lists, you're going to be able to see that the names come in a variety of orders. And I'll just let you uh, look at that on your own. But also, let's, let's make mention of a couple things. The groups stay similar. There's three groups of four names each. And those stay similar. But sometimes the names get jumbled around, but not the names of what I'll call the leaders of each of these groups. So you can see that Simon Peter is listed as the first of those four, right? And then if you jump down to the next set of four, you see Philip listed. And then if you look further down, you see James, son of Alphaeus. And so you can kind of see these concentric circles of people that Jesus was pouring into, all 12 important, vital, a, a part of his apostleship. And yet he is intentionally, strategically going towards um, seemingly Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And we can actually see this. If you were to do just kind of a search, and I use this in my Lagos Bible software, just the mentions, you see this bore out in the mentions here. I just pulled up Peter. And if you look there, I mean, he is 375 mentions, 308 mentions, 137. So you just see him hundreds of times. His name is mentioned. Then you drop down to that next category of uh, disciples. Philip is only mentioned uh, 16 times. And then James, son of Elpheus, the leader of the last group, four times in the four lists of the, of the disciples. So he didn't get a lot, of, a lot of print. But again, even if you stop here and pause to think through Simon Peter, common, ordinary guy, right? When we met him just a few weeks ago, he was fishing. Jesus shows up, causes this miraculous catch of fish after him and his buddies had caught nothing. What's his response? Go away from me, I'm a sinful one, okay? Then we're gonna see him follow Jesus in his earthly ministry, He's going to make this crazy declaration that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one we've been waiting for. Right after that, Jesus is going to say, all right, now that you have that clear, that I am actually the Messiah, I'm going to tell you, I must suffer and die. To which Peter goes, no, 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 that's not going to happen, we'll protect you. And, and Jesus calls him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. That doesn't have my plans in mind. Okay, so here's Peter. He's a sinful one. Okay, then he's called Satan a messenger of Satan, right? And then you fast forward to the end when um, Jesus is gonna die and he makes all these declarations like, I'll never leave you. And then this little girl starts questioning and says, weren't you with him? I'm pretty sure you were with him. And he's like, no, 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 not only wasn't I with him, I don't even know him, okay? He denies Christ. That is the foremost listed disciple, the foremost apostle of Jesus Christ, common, ordinary, broken, sinful. 
just the kind of guy you want to take over the world with, right? I mean, it's crazy, the people that found themselves as one of the apostles. And so what I want to do now is I want to expand this. I want to say, so what? Who cares? All right, he chose 12. Good for them. What, what does that have to do with us? And I, and I do want to balloon back and just say, what, what was true of them is true of the disciples around them, which is really true of the church and, and all followers of Christ in all places at all times. And so I want to just hit three things with you as to what does this matter? Why, why should we care? What does it look like to be a follower of Christ? What makes for a disciple of Jesus Christ? And for some of you, you're, you're already there. You're already a follower of Christ. And so um, what I'd ask you to do is just use this as a spiritual checkup. Just honestly, just open your heart before God and just say, God, how, where are we at? How are we doing in this? That's, that's all I'm asking for. I'm not, I'm not asking for you know, dramatic displays uh, you know, proclamations, mighty promises. I'm just saying, will you just examine yourself before God? And, and maybe if you find something there, just, just talk to somebody about that. You know, if you find something in you that's just not here, then talk to someone. That's, that's all I'm looking for. And if you're not yet a follower of Christ, I'd encourage you. Consider these things. This is available to you. This is not just for the few, the proud, the Marines, the few, the proud, the, the mighty Christians. It's like, no, discipleship, this is for common, ordinary people, just like you. And so this, this can be uh, yours. And so let me, let me just hit the first, let me just hit all three right at the beginning, and then we'll, we'll kind of unpack them as we go. Number one, uh, we're called to be united to Christ. Union with Jesus Christ. That's the first step in any person's relationship with, with God is to unite yourself to Jesus Christ. Number two, abide in Christ. Remain in him. Stay there. Don't wander, right? So abide in Christ. And then number three, bear fruit for Christ. Bear fruit for Christ. So unite yourself to Christ. Abide in Christ. Bear fruit for Christ. Unite, abide, and bear. U-A-B. U-A-B is what you need to remember. U-A-B UAB, UAB is the winner. <sighs> Iowa State does not <laughs> win. You need to know that UAB is the answer. It's, it's the spiritual answer. It was sitting there all along. Wait, are we still talking about spiritual things? Where, what, are we, what are we talking about here? Hold on, hold on. Oh, man. There is nothing as heartbreaking as having your bracket busted. It was like the first game or the second game, right? It was like, it was early for them to go out. And so when you have them, as I do, playing Kentucky for the national championship, <laughs> you might as well just be done watching basketball at that point, right? Oh, my goodness. Learn from my mistake. Oh, wow. Um, what was I talking about again? UAB. Some of you are wondering, how, how hard did he work to make that fit, right? That's what you're thinking. How hard? It actually was staring me in the face. I was going to go with United Abide and Bear uh, before this, and then I'm just like, but that's not very memorable. How could I make that rhyme or the same letter or all vowels? Or I was kind of wrestling with him, like, UAB, UAB, that's nothing, that's nothing. I'm like, that's something from this past week. That is something that hurts from this past week. UAB. It's right there. All right. Back on track here. So let's walk through these just one at a time. And again, just examine, just self-reflection. What will this uh, look like? So you, starting with union in Christ. John Murray says this about union with Christ. This, he wrote a book uh, called Redemption. That's, that's cool. Like you can write a book just called Redemption. Um, and he says this, union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation, okay? Union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. It is not simply a phase of the application of redemption. It underlies every aspect of redemption. So when I talk union with Christ and all the different facets of how beautiful salvation is and redemption and having a relationship with God is, union with Christ is the underlying element to all of it. And so therefore it has to be present as we think through being a follower of Christ, being a disciple of his, okay? Look what Mark 3.14 says. Again, going to a different, a comparable calling of the 12. Look what it says. 
he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Now we get the, we, we naturally gravitate towards, uh, okay, he's going to send them out to preach at something. That's the bare fruit part. But they were appointed to do what? Just be with him. That's, that's it. That, what's your job over the next three years? Hang out with me. Be with me. Right? That's, that's your role. And by being with me, that's going to help with the, the abiding and the bearing fruit. But first, just your appointment to be an apostle is just to go where I go, do what I do, say what I say. Just be with him. They're appointed to be with him. I just think of uh, School of Rock. I, I, I think often in movies, uh, when, when considering spiritual truths, or apparently basketball. Um, you remember when uh, in School of Rock, where Jack Black's character is like ha- handing out positions in the band, you know, and they're, you're going to be like the drummer, and the, you get the different vocalists, and one girl's overlooked as a vocalist, so she's like, I want to be a vocalist, and she sings, and you're like, that's amazing, you're a vocalist, right? And then it gets to the end, and there's just like these people left over. They just got... They, just like, oh, no special talent. What do we do with them? And, and they become groupies, and their job is just like worship the band. That's your job, right? You remember that? It's just like, you got one job to do. Just worship the band. That's it. That's all you have to worry about. And I think how often, just in my own Christian life, where I just forget that. Like, your job every day is what? Worship God. That's it, all right? Do that. We get things out of whack when we miss that and we start doing other things, even going on to good Christian things like abiding and bearing fruit. If we miss worship, that God is number one, that God is our supreme treasure, if we bypass that and get onto other things, that's religion. And it's false religion. It's actually more damaging and more harmful than if somebody had showed up and said, I'm an atheist, I hate God, what does your church have for me? Because in this sense, you're doing Christian things, but you miss the number one. That's actually more harmful. And so every one of us need to be reminded every morning, what's your job today? Worship God. Every day, worship him. What are we going to do tomorrow? Worship, worship, worship God. This continues. Um, John 6, 66 to 69. From the time many of his disciples turned back no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Are you at that point in your union with Christ? You are saying, I worship you and there's no one else, God. That's what union with Christ looks like, signifies. There's no one else. There's nowhere else to go. You're not holding a reserve. You don't have a plan B. It's him or nothing or no one. There's two aspects to union in Christ, and I'm just going to hit a verse from each side of this. The one is that we're in Christ, and the second is that he's in you. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. I can remember a, a time early in my, my walk with Jesus where I was having that, that weird reality. I came to faith as a 19-year-old, and I was kind of uh, thinking of, of high school friends and, and, and just the, recognize, coming into that place of recognize, like, none of them know the new me. I've, I've put myself in Christ through, through faith, and I believe I'm a new creation and that the old is gone, and I, I had this, like, kind of came to myself and just like, they, don't, they actually don't know me. They, they did know me and they, they know the old me, but they, they and then this, this was amplified when all of a sudden Facebook happens and just like, oh, now I'm reconnecting with all of them, but many of them won't have any idea of the transformation that has taken place. Like, there's just this awkward deal of wanting to like, hey, hey, how, how you doing? I, uh, uh, you remember, uh, you, I'm not what I, I, it's just awkward. I'm like, how do, I, how do I communicate that that old core has died and there's a new core? And there might be some people that would be like, no, you were fine, you were great, it's okay. But there are some people that I know. I, try, I just would walk over and hold myself 
up over and, and just to, to come to that place of recognizing, all right, I'm not going to be able to go back and tell every single person, but just the recognition of God is in me. I'm a new creation. And that old core has died. And I need to keep moving ahead in my new identity. Certain things, obviously, there's certain things and characteristics and personality stuff that, that doesn't change. But there's certain parts of that old core that, that needed to die. And that still took time to die and are still trying to die. The second half of it is not just that we're in Christ, but Christ is in us, as Galatians says. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so this first point of union with Christ, I just want to do that spiritual checkup, just just asking the question, go back in the last week, two weeks, to a time maybe where you got bent out of shape. Something happened that just you weren't expecting, it didn't meet your expectations, it kind of threw you off, and I just want to ask the question, is the gospel enough? Why wasn't the gospel enough? Why was God proving insufficient? Is it because God is insufficient? I don't think so. And so we can just, we can just check, all right, God, is it you? Am I worshiping you? Or did I, did I pause somewhere to start worshiping myself or people's opinions of me or a certain status or getting to a place in life where I could then settle or, or what is it? Check your union with Christ by just saying, is he enough? Is he still all sufficient? My guess is many of you made that decision to follow Christ and at one point you just said unequivocally, maybe even from the top of your lungs in worship, you're enough. Give me Christ. Give me only Jesus. Or as the song says, what? Else I die. That's, that's all you needed at one time. Why is it all of a sudden now that you're starting to put other hooks on there of what you need in life? So I'm just asking the question, will you just do a quick spiritual checkup that you need other things beyond just Christ? Secondly, abide in me. UAB, UAB. You're not going to get that out of your head now, are you? UAB, every year from now, I'm picking them all the way. Uh, they, already, they already lost in the round of 32. So um, abide in me, remain in me. Some of, your, some of your versions might say remain in me. And this is a lot of, uh, actually John's gospel has a ton of language about this. Um, so let's just, let's just look a little bit. At what, what does it mean for somebody to not just unite themselves to Christ, but then abide or remain in him? Luke 9 says this. Jesus said to them all, okay, not just the apostles, he said to them all, even religious leaders, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Deny yourself, so you're, again, deny yourself, why? Because I'm going to worship God, God's number one, God is my everything, and then do this, when? Day after day after day, follow Jesus, day after day after day, again and again and again. In John 8, we see this, even as he spoke, many believed in Jesus. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let me go to a little bit of application land, because I think for me, as I'm, as I'm talking to people, as I'm, I'm thinking through um, the spiritual climate of hope, it's often, maybe, maybe three, four, five, six, maybe some of you did this today, you write on the back of your communication card, I'm just, I'm just having a tough time making time for Jesus. And I get that. I get, I get busy lives, busy people. You all have a lot going on. I get that. But one of the chief ways to remain, to abide, is to figure out, no, 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 I'm going to find that time. I'm going to make that time. And I'm not saying you have to do it my way. Or you have to do it like, well, this guy has the way in which you connect with Jesus. Like, no, no, no. Find something that's meaningful for you. Every relationship, every friendship that you have, you relate to them differently, right? Like, you have some of those relationships where you're like, man, we might not see each other for a couple months, but we just pick it up right where we left off. And other people, you need daily connections, daily conversations, right? Some of the freshmen need to call their moms daily they're on spring break. They're not here. They didn't even hear that joke. Uh, all right. So, right? But you relate to the different people in your life, right, differently. And, it, and so you don't have to look at the person next to you and go, wow, they pray every morning, 5.30, 6.30. Look at them, you know? 
You don't have to do that. But what is the meaningful way that you connect with God? One of the ways that I would encourage you to think through is what are the ways that you get God's word into you? Because I think this is one of the ways that Jesus is communicating. You need my truth. You need my teaching. Okay? And he's talking to the religious leaders who had a bunch of Old Testament scrolls. But it seemed like they weren't working because Jesus was recasting those, right? And, and teaching them afresh, anew. What do we have? We have his words. We have his example throughout our Gospels. And I think we need to sit under that. And so I just want to encourage you. What does, I don't know if it's daily Bible reading, but what does some sort of ongoing, can we switch up daily for some sort of consistent, habitual, something where it's happening, not just like once, not just you heard me read it here, but just something where it's getting into you, okay? And maybe it's not reading. Maybe you're listening to it on your, on your commute, you know, walking between classes, whatever. I, I'm not saying how to do it. I'm just saying Jesus said it's important. And I, I think it is. I think, I think we, could, we could come before God in prayer uh, for, for years asking for like, God, just give me those five words. Just give me those three words. Just tell me what to do. And it's just like, or... We could pick this up and have thousands of words at the ready that God's Holy Spirit would want to then cast and say, all right, now what this means for your life today is, and then fill it in. He's faithful to do that by his Spirit to communicate what you need in the moment. John Bunyan, you know, this is, this is the phrase that comes back to me again and again when, when I'm struggling, because it is, it's a struggle. I'm a professional Christian, I'm a pastor, and yet it's a struggle for me just to open it up. I get it. I'm with you on that, okay? And John Bunyan says, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And so I need to check my heart and recognize, okay, is it really that I don't have enough time? Is that it? Because I can update you on what happened in the NCAA tournament. Why? Because I watched games, plural, okay? And so did I really not have enough time? Did you really not have enough time or did we just prioritize our time differently? And if there's a concern there, then again, I don't want to beat you over the head with that. I want to come back to it just saying, where's our worship? Where's our union with Christ? Are we drawing strength from that, that God is number one? All right, then here we go. Then if that's true, we've checked that. Now let's practically make him number one in a few important areas. I gave you a Keller quote that was very East Coast last week, very in your face, not Midwestern at all, and uh, I'm going to give you from 1 John 2, something that's not Midwestern at all, all right? This is in your Bible. This is what John says. Whoever says, I know him, I know Christ, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, Love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must also live as Jesus did. That's a hard teaching. Somehow your obedience matters. Do you have to obey in order to be accepted? Is that what you're saying? It's like, no, no, no. Let's get all these in the right order. Union with Christ, worship of God. He's accepting me, not on my own accord, because of what Christ has done on the cross. That's true. That's reality. And yet somehow I must hold in tension this passage, which says this is an outward manifestation of that worship. An outward manifestation of love for God is obeying and doing what he says. And again, if we're not doing what he says, let's come back again and acknowledge this part. Are we worshiping other things? Are we worshiping lesser things? Are we worshiping ourselves? But if we're here, maturity is not just in how much you know. Let's, let's acknowledge that maturity is through obedience. And that's simply over time is what, where we, what we call character. You form the character of Christ over a long period of time by obeying every day in the moment. And so just again, to stop and give a spiritual checkup, where are we at on that? And if there's been some struggle here, go back here, let's make sure we're good on the union and the worship, and then, all right, now what does it look like to make him your priority? If he's your number one, 
treasured, then what does it look like today to make him number one? And again, this is not just because it's true and right or pastor says, it's actually because you and I believe that this being in him is good and life-giving. It's to your best interest, to your gain, to spend time with the Lord. U, A, and now B. Union, abiding, and bearing fruit. And that's just a really hard picture to look at, isn't it? But I think it's descriptive of why we want to be in Christ, united with him, abiding in him, that we might bear fruit. Let me read from John 15 here. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Showing yourselves to be my disciples bearing fruit okay so now we got this kind of threefold we're united him number one worship who god all right we're abiding we're remaining and as we do that we bear fruit fruit that lasts this gives evidence that we're actually followers of his let me give you two fruits that we're looking for fruit of character already mentioned this a little bit in the abiding area but john 13 says this a new command i give you love one another As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He's talking not like, hey, you need to love that person that's unlovable out there. He's saying, no, no, love one another. As apostles, you 12 have to love one another. As a group of disciples that are gathered together called the church, you have to love one another. This is actually something, a message that the church needs to hear. We need to love one another. Tim Keller says this about leadership. This is, you want to know what spiritual leaders, Christian leaders, vocational people like myself, pastors do? This is what he says leadership is. If you're a leader in any way at all, if you're the head of a department or an institution, or if you're in any kind of capacity in which you're considered a leader, most of what is called leadership is really, and then he like has to gather his thoughts, you know? 90% of what you're doing is trying to keep all of the human relationships of the individuals who are underneath you from blowing apart. If If you're ever in leadership, you realize people are always getting slighted, always getting upset, always getting offended, always falling out with each other all the time. That's not something that just happens outside the church. That's something that happens in the church, okay? People are getting slighted. Where? In the church. Getting upset. Where? In the church. Getting offended. Where? In the church. By other Christians. We're doing this to one another. And so Jesus recognizes that. And he says, your job is to love one another. Serve one. Move toward one another. And he shows them what love is. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, right? He goes, he bends down, he washes the feet of his disciples. He said, then you should do likewise. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So somehow love being translated into serving Making yourself lower, taking that nature. You want to be first, make yourself last. You want to be the greatest, make yourself the least of all. There's something about the way that Jesus loves and cares for people that looks a lot like humble, common, ordinary servitude. So there's the fruit of character and then there's the fruit of mission, which is a common passage from Matthew 28. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So consider this, right? All authority in heaven and earth is given to Jesus, and what does he do with that? He pours into 12. That's what he does. He's got all authority. He has control over weather patterns. And he says, my best hope is these 12. I'm going to go through these 12. Right? It's crazy. 
But not only that, not only is this mission kind of starting here, but it's reflective of the first two. Union with Christ. Why? Baptism, right? Baptism is symbolic of what? Union with Jesus. You're, ra- you're, you're lowered into the ground and you're raised back up. You're dead to sin with Christ. You're raised in new life with him. So this baptism deal that they're going to go forward is, is, is indicative of union with Christ. Then this abiding, this remaining is indicative of what? Obedience. Teach them to obey. Now just keep this going. Perpetuate this in other places. Go make disciples that will have union and abiding. And then they'll turn around and bear fruit. And that's, we see this cycling forward. UAB, unite, abide, bear fruit. Unite, abide, bear fruit. Let me just pause there again to just ask about, is there... Is there anything in character where you you just see the growth in character being stunted? Just something in you where you're not seeing the fruit like you want. And then again, let's just march it back. All right, are we, are we connecting intentionally with Jesus? Are we seeking to abide and remain? If there's challenges there, all right, let's come back to number one. Are we set that God is number one worthy of worship? Is he our treasure? Yes, he is. All right, now what's happening here in the abiding and the remaining? Can we do something, change things, connect intentionally, get other people in the community? What do we need there that we might bear fruit in character. And then again, is there in you a heart to connect with other people? I'm not saying that you have to become a vocational Christian. Many followed Jesus and stayed in their vocation, right? I'm not calling for that. I'm just saying, is there in you a heart to reach out to other people? Share the gospel? Maybe. Live out the gospel? Absolutely. Every day, live it out. Light, salt, that's you. A lot of people will come to me and just go, oh, if you could just come to my office. I'm not in best position to reach your coworker for Christ. You are. You're the best person in position to reach your family member for Jesus. They don't know me. They don't give a rip about me. You're special to them. I'm common, ordinary, easily forgettable. But you, they'll never forget you. You're in the cubicle right next to them listening to that music. They won't ever forget you. So coming back to this, what makes for a disciple of Christ? I think it's those things. Not, not less than that. Certainly there's more that we could have talked about, but not less than that. And it's interesting. Is this enough to change the world? Is this enough? Is it really? When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. The fact that we're sitting in these two buildings reflective of, yes, this is sufficient. This is sufficient for what God needs to bring forth his mission and message and kingdom. Common, ordinary people like you and me living for an extraordinary God. That's it. There's no big surprise. There's no big, oh, now let me pull the curtain back and show you how the silver bullet. No. You and me, struggling, laboring, day in, day out, picking up our cross daily, following him. This is not dissimilar to what the disciples would face, the apostles would face. This is what we're called to. For some of you, maybe for the first time, you're called to this. You have the opportunity to respond to this. And so let me just ask you, are you, do you recognize we are common, ordinary people believing in extraordinary God? Do you believe that? Not only that, are you excited about that? Does it fire you up? Let's pray together.